let's, let's give it a start. <laughs> Thank you very much for um, the invitation first uh, to this um, uh, very exciting event where we can discuss uh, topics from all uh, um, angles of uh, competition law and uh, the purpose of today's uh, panel of this uh, panel is to uh, give an insight, try to discuss the, the current topics or the hot topics in a specific sector which is the pharma sector and I'm uh, extremely grateful for our guests to have joined today uh, to discuss these issues uh, from maybe two uh, different and interesting perspectives. So I have on my right uh, Fleur Ehrenschmidt, um, who um, has more than 20 years experience uh, in law. She started her career in private practice and uh, worked for uh, uh, several years uh, in uh, international law firms where we met and worked together uh, before moving to um, before moving in-house, uh, in, um, uh, uh, she, so she joined Novartis in 2013, first as a um, uh, senior legal counsel um, for uh, competition, and then um, she expanded her practice, in-house practice, uh, by moving to, um, uh, to the global product and portfolio strategy team as a senior legal counsel in 2019. And uh, she has been providing support to the uh, uh, international ophthalmology uh, franchise. And uh, in 2019, she was appointed as uh, head of uh, legal uh, for the region Europe, Pharma. Um, on my left, I have uh, Grimor Johansson, uh, who is a, a legal manager at the European Federation for Pharmaceutical Industries uh, and Associations, I think, for those working in and with the pharmaceutical sector that are familiar with the role of uh, FPA um, in, as, a, as a trade association at European level. Um, and uh, I hope that uh, Grimor will be sharing with us uh, the perspective uh, from, uh, from the pharma, more general pharma industry uh, perspective at European level, but also the interaction with, uh, uh, with European institution and um, um, maybe the, the advocacy role or uh, the, the way um, companies are, and the industry is um, interacting with the European institutions on all these issues that uh, uh, we hope to discuss. Uh, so uh, Grimor has um, joined the uh, FPI in 2020 and before that he was uh, working for seven years at the European Free Trade Association. Um, so uh, thank you very much for uh, joining us uh, today, both of you. Um, I think the, the way I would like to um, structure our discussion is to uh, try to make a kind of a traveling time into uh, antitrust enforcement in the pharmaceutical sector. And I will mm, introduce uh, this panel by a very short uh, overview of how uh, antitrust um, rules have been uh, applied and enforced in, in Europe by uh, the authorities. What were the topics that um, uh, were tackled by competition authorities uh, along the, um, during the, over the years? And then try to detect what the, the trends, the current trends are, and maybe then try to uh, look into, maybe not a crystal ball, but uh, uh, based on these trends, uh, see what the future holds for us and what are the uh, topics that companies should be looking at and how enforcers will be um, uh, working on, on those issues. And along, the, along these lines, maybe ask ourselves the question, um, what is the role today for competition law and what is the role for uh, competition authorities in, um, in a sector where uh, there is a lot of... Uh, um, interaction, I would say, but also uh, a sector that is extremely regulated and where regulatory uh, law is uh, extremely present. So my very uh, quick overview of uh, the, the cases that uh, are kind of more the, the landmark cases uh, in uh, pharma, infor uh, antitrust enforcement in, in the pharma sector, uh, there is a 
big chunk of the case law, I would say, up until 2007, 2008, maybe, which are uh, cases on parallel trade and quota systems. And uh, to some extent, it's logical because uh, from the very beginning, and uh, this is one of the uh, key policies uh, of the European Union has always been uh, free movement of goods and uh, um, uh, re strengthening the internal market, um, which, uh, look, looking from a uh, company's perspective and uh, the way uh, businesses um, may create obstacles to free trade, uh, in the pharmaceutical sector, this translated uh, into a very long line of uh, uh, case law around parallel trade and um, uh, the restrictions that uh, uh, could have been uh, put on um, on this by um, uh, pharmaceutical companies. Um, and today we can say that uh, the issue is more or less settled. We had uh, uh, the latest, I think, landmark cases in the CFET uh, case where um, we can see where the bar <laughs> was uh, set and there is some as some ground for uh, restricting um, parallel imports or exports um, by pharmaceutical companies precisely because this is a field where uh, uh, prices are regulated and th therefore um, taking advantage of uh, lower or higher prices in different national markets uh, is not something that uh, is necessarily beneficial for uh, um, for uh, consumers, if we can speak about consumers for pharmaceutical products. Uh, so therefore, there have been um, rules set for this. And then starting from uh, 2009 uh, or 8 and 9 with the sectoral uh, uh, inquiry uh, that was carried out by the European Commission, uh, the focus uh, shifted to, to um, uh, pay for delay, uh, which was uh, um, a way to tackle uh, the practices uh, preventing entry into the market of generic products. Uh, and uh, there was a whole lot of uh, um, cases uh, up until today, even uh, when we consider the, uh, the appeals and the, the decisions that have been taken by uh, the European courts. And um, these are cases where we have seen the interaction between um, patent law, uh, IP rights, and, uh, and competition law, uh, because basically you pay for delay and settlements um, uh, for uh, um, the purpose of which is primarily uh, to, um, to settle an IP dispute, uh, can have an impact on the um, um, on, and, you know, on, on competition, on how competition plays and how uh, new entrants could be prevented from entering the market. So this is a um, um, set of uh, case law that is very interesting and we, we, which we have seen with the, the Lundbeck, the Servier, the today, uh, more, more recently with Tevez Efalon, but they are very uh, similar cases. The Commission has uh, set the way uh, it, it, it applies rules um, in this um, in this area, uh, and um, from starting from uh, 2016, I would say, uh, or a little bit before, uh, we have seen a new trend or a new uh, topic in uh, uh, in pharma cases, which was uh, the excessive pricing uh, cases. Uh, more at the level of uh, national competition authorities. We have seen uh, quite some cases in the UK with the um, notable Pfizer-Flynn case, which was uh, uh, um, where the CMA's decision was uh, annulled by the um, Competition Appeal Tribunal, and then a second decision was taken, and where we have seen uh, the, the, the application of um, um, traditional antitrust rules that were set in the, uh, uh, in the United Brands case uh, with the standard about uh, what is an unfair price and how do we decide what is excessive, uh, but which might be of uh, difficult uh, application in the pharmaceutical sector precisely because uh, prices are regulated and so it is difficult to say, okay, where is the, where is the, uh, um, the dividing point, what is excessive, 
considering that the prices are not set on the basis of uh, standard market uh, supply and demand uh, conditions, but uh, where uh, regulators are intervening to, to set those prices. And then today we start seeing a new uh, set of uh, cases also at, um, at national level mainly, uh, but which starts to have some spillover <laughs> at, at the European level uh, with the so-called um, disparagement practices cases, which also tend to tackle the, uh, the restrictions or um, limitations that uh, are put on the entry of, um, of generic, uh, generic medicines. Um, and we have seen the, um, uh, the Sanofi uh, and the sharing plow cases in, in France, where, which are purely these disparagement cases, basically where uh, the pharmaceutical companies were sanctioned for having uh, communicated to health professionals uh, information that is accurate um, most of the time, but which is perceived as uh, um, disparaging in the sense that uh, it, um, uh, questions the, the findings of regulators who have uh, granted the generic status of, uh, of the medication and which have established legally uh, the bioequivalence of, um, of a generic medication uh, uh, to, as compared to the originator product. And most recently we have seen another um, evolution of this, uh, of this practice with the so-called unfounded interventions where pharmaceutical companies have been sanctioned, uh, especially in France, with uh, two landmark cases. Uh, the first one was uh, in the Janssen Silag um, uh, case in 2017, where uh, Janssen was, um, uh, got a very high uh, fine for uh, on the one hand, a disparagement, but on the other hand, uh, the so-called legally unfounded interventions, um, and uh, which uh, were, um, were whereby the French Competition Authority um, held that uh, the fact for a pharmaceutical company to speak to a regulator to try to convince them that uh, for, due to safety reasons, the generic status of a, of a medication should not be granted in the sense that it should not lead to um, under national law substitution of this, uh, um, uh, of this medication to the reference product in, in, in a situation where there are safety concerns in a, in a very um, um, specific case, well, this is something that, uh, that is anti-competitive because um, if there is a case law that says that this is not admissible, um, the, um, the, 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 when, uh, well, a dominant company uh, going to the regulator and uh, trying to convince them that they should take a certain position or they should take into consideration um, scientific uh, data in order to uh, not to list uh, a medication as a generic and therefore authorize substitution is um, unfounded and therefore uh, an anti-competitive practice. And then we come to, uh, to the last case. So this, uh, the Janssen case has recently been confirmed uh, on appeal and on uh, cassation. So it's a, it's a final decision. Uh, and then we come to um, um, a case uh, uh, that goes even further than the, the Janssen case, which was uh, uh, limited on legal to, to legally unfounded uh, interventions, and in the Novartis Roche case, which was about uh, um, two um, medical um, um, medicinal products, one of which was authorized for um, um, ophthalmological uh, disease. Um, and the other one was authorized for a completely different, um, uh, in, in, for a cancer treatment, um, but could also be used and uh, has been used in, in some instances uh, outside its um, um, authorization, so off-label. Um, so when uh, 
Novartis, who was uh, the, um, um, the holder of the marketing authorization of uh, uh, the ophthalmo ophthalmological <laughs> medication, discussed issues relating to the possibility to, to use or not to use off-label um, uh, um, the, the other medical <laughs> um, uh, um, sorry, uh, product uh, outside of its uh, authorization. Well, these discussions with the regulators or with the uh, uh, with health professionals were beyond the uh, the limits of uh, what is authorized, and then can amount to a disparagement practice um, or also to an unfounded intervention. So. We have come to a, um, to, to a point where um, there is clearly an interaction between uh, this regulatory set of rules uh, which govern in a very strict way medications in the, in the pharmaceutical sector and competition law which uh, tends maybe to go beyond what is the classical way of implementing competition rules. So I think this is uh, uh, something that uh, sets already uh, a trend on which I would like to uh, have the point of view of, um, uh, of our guests and uh, uh, both from, um, from a company perspective and from a, a more general industry perspective. And the second topic that I would like to uh, turn this discussion around is um, um, the... So First, in the interaction between uh, competition law and regulatory law, and the second is the pricing, because uh, when we look at the excessive pricing cases, clearly there is an issue of okay, what is the fair? Is there a fair price for medication? How do we set pricing? And is there a role for competition law to play in this in this process? And on on the basis of what? criteria on, on how do we proceed. And all this, of course, in the, in the interest of uh, companies who need to have some legal certainty. So I turn to Fleur now on the first topic about what is the role for competition law or, uh, and or competition authorities uh, looking at these uh, new trends in uh, competition law. So I think first, before I start, I promised I would make three disclaimers. The first one is that I've worked on a number of cases both when I was at ANO with um, Liliana, and actually even before that when I see the 1996 to 2008 barrel trades. So a lot of these I was involved in, obviously, so I may be considered as biased. A number of these I was involved as an in-house lawyer, so that could also be considered a bias. Uh, the second disclaimer is I actually I'm saying, don't quote a Novartis lawyer, but just a pharma industry lawyer. So that's the promise I made to my colleagues in antitrust at Novartis. Uh, that being said, I think my, my starting point, which is really fundamental, is there is definitely a lot of room for antitrust authorities in the pharma sector. The pharma sector is a very competitive industry. I know we often talk, you know, the, the way markets are defined gives the impression we're 200 companies, which at some stage for some of our products are considered as having monopoly power. But this is actually very, very diverse, very competitive at all stages of the research, the development, and the marketing. And because it's so regulated, it's essential for companies to know that competition will be applied, because obviously you not only you know, you do hope that your competitors will actually be subject to the same rules as you are and will not be taking shortcuts on the market. So that consistent and strong application of competition law is essential. It's also important because, you know, there are many areas of the pharma life, if I may say, where there's actually a lot of room for free behavior. And for me, anywhere where you're free to behave, competition law has a role to play. And it is a strong guarantee. It's something that's completely incorporated in the compliance part also of any pharma company. Where we do see an issue in the recent years, and I see it when I look at this, is one thing that is absolutely indispensable for in-house lawyers is predictability and consistency. And predictability means you need to be able to have at least some rough idea of not just where the law is going, but when the enforcement is going. 
because when you advise, you're not advising as the day of today, based on these facts and based on these law, if I may say, as you see in private practice, you will have all the disclaimers and footnotes about which facts and law you're considering, so that at the time of your advice, your advice is correct legally. We're advising for the years to come, because we know if things go well in the next five years, when this might be looked at, we will be here and we will have to defend the advice we gave. We need to be sure the company doesn't get in trouble in five years for what you're telling them they can do now. But that means also if it turns into crystal ball gazing, which sometimes it does, this, this becomes almost impossible, which for one thing has a massive compliance cost for the company, because that means that they're investing more and more in trying to predict trends which are often unpredictable. And it means also there's a massive economic and innovation opportunity loss, because we'll speak later the whole you know, excessive pricing copy-pasting to the pharma industry with regulated prices, some of the principles that you have in free markets just doesn't make sense. And it means you end up actually as an industry often being more conservative than you could be. And being more conservative, notably, isn't about excessive pricing. It's about not going lower. It's about, you know, being hesitant to do portfolio rebates to even, you know, give away in poor countries a bunch of products for $1 because you're like, am I going to be sued for predatory pricing when I'm just trying to ensure access in poorer countries? So th this field is super important. Assuming, and we, we see it here, I mean, the, the way I see it as a lawyer with my ex-antitrust hat, there are a number of decisions in those lists, especially when you take the excessive pricing and the disparagement. If you took the last one and you made that the first decision in that area, people will be jumping off their chairs. And what we do see is the salami tactic, you know, as they refer to it, and yes, Prime Minister, that the first decision often you can find cases where it makes sense. There's some, you know, obvious gross misbehavior, and you're like, you know, however you build a case, you're like, yes, it makes sense. And then, you know, from one decision to the next, you push a little further, you push a little further, and then suddenly you end up in a field, which is where for us it becomes a real issue where you have our regulators on the one hand, and you know, we heard earlier again the, our antitrust uh, representatives saying we are not regulators. We have regulators in the industry. In some countries like Italy, IFA regulates both access to market and pricing. Countries like France, you have the INSM for health and safety and marketing authorization. You have the CRPS for the pricing. In most countries, there are two different authorities that work closely together. They're highly specialized authorities in that specific field with scientific expertise, economic expertise. They're also taking decisions which are broader than just a patient perspective because they're looking at both how do I ensure access for patients, how do I ensure also prices which will maintain innovation for pharma companies to launch, how do I manage also my overall budget in the country on healthcare spending, on medicinal products. And those very complex decisions are expressed through positions that they take. As an industry, we need to be able to know we can rely on the authorities expressed by our regulators. And when we start having antitrust cases that tell us either you cannot speak to your regulator, including in the Jean saint silac case, where this was actually a tripartite dialogue, so you know the originator company was also having exchanges on the same topic with the originate with sorry, the regulator. So each party was defending basically its position. So when antitrust authorities start telling you either you cannot talk to your regulator or even worse, you have you know, authorities expressing clear positions and the antitrust authority says, I don't care because I'm, different, you know, I'm defending a different purpose, basically, which ultimately it isn't because all this is about patients. But anyway, the antitrust authority says, I'm, you know, from my perspective, which is different and which I can enforce, I'm actually going to either ignore or even contr contradict the positions taken then this creates a massive area where we have no visibility left in an industry where every single thing we do is scrutinized. And I think the compliance, innovation, and ethical cost of that is actually extremely high. So do I think antitrust has a role to play? Definitely, and we want it to be played. As I said, it is a guarantee for companies to know that the other ones cannot do whatever they want on the market. But is there a limit in regulated industry, personally, Generally, from 20 years' experience as a pharma lawyer, yes, there is. And there's a moment where, you know, authorities with exclusive jurisdiction should actually be prevailing, at least in the positions they express. Thank you, Fleur. Uh, that's uh, indeed a very uh, um, 
helpful suggestion. Um, I will turn to, to Grimor. Um, I forgot to mention that uh, Grimor is leading the, the FBI working group on uh, legal affairs and, and competition. Are all these subjects part of your discussion and how, from your European perspective, you are seeing these? Um, actually, we've seen the Commission uh, in the last two years launch two investigations based on disparagement, which are to some extent uh, inspired by, by the French cases. Are they these topics that are discussed in, uh, in your working group or with the authorities? Thank you. Um, yes, well, the, the short answer is yes. Obviously, uh, we as, as a trade association, um, we follow all the case law, we follow the, uh, the developments in the various countries and uh, is of course of, of of great relevance to uh, the, the lawyers of our companies to know what is happening in, uh, in the competition enforcement throughout Europe and then uh, in, in the, well, spilling over into the, into the EU sector as well. I think um, as a trade association, however, we don't necessarily play a role in these cases. We don't uh, intervene, we don't intervene on behalf of our members. Um, what we are interested in is on the one hand, how, uh, how policy affects the, the enforcement uh, trends and how then the cases in turn will affect future policy. Uh, and, and this is where uh, I think our role becomes a little bit more important in terms of uh, making sure that industry uh, interests are um, you know, are maintained and are communicated with regulators and with enforcers, but also with policy makers. Um, and you know, we we have currently the uh, the pharmaceutical legislation is currently under review, and as has been mentioned, the pharmaceutical sector as a whole is a heavily uh, regulated sector and rightly so it is a, it, you know, there are a lot of regulatory requirements which companies need to go through from uh, from research and development all the way to uh, to placing a product on the market uh, and this legislation is currently under review and we are we are working very hard to make sure that basically the ability of our companies to innovate is not uh, there, that obstacles are not created at any level uh, for our companies to continue to create innovative products and making sure that these innovative products, that, uh, that there is a route to patient, that there is access. And we, you know, we speak about access, availability, and affordability. If those, three, uh, if those three key aspects are not linked to a product, then ultimately the, uh, the, the product will have been a failure as there is no interest in a, a pharmaceutical company to manufacture a product which will not be uh, access, to which patients will not have access. Um, you know, I, I could speak about the, uh, the access proposals that, uh, that FPA have, uh, have laid forward, uh, put forward in, in the past few months. Um, I think in terms of excessive pricing and especially the the cases that we've seen on excessive pricing, uh, there are important caveats to be made and to, to avoid the, the notion that because there is an, a case of excessive pricing in the pharma sector that all medicine is too expensive. The, the excessive pricing cases that we are seeing are very specific and you know, are, have very, uh, very clear circumstances that lead there to be uh, you know, an ultimate decision that uh, these prices are excessive. We're talking about products that have been on the market for a very long time, that are, um, that are uh, off patent. Uh, we're talking about market behavior alongside a price increase that leads, com uh, that leads uh, competition authorities to look, into the, uh, to look into the prices. Ultimately, the pricing is the last thing it's the it's the uh, effect of uh, a, a list of, of uh, market behavior, and we as an industry, as as Fleur mentioned, we want this kind of competition uh, enforcement. We want there to be rigorous competition scrutiny because you know these are competitors. We want a competitive market. Where we have an issue is, as Fleur mentioned as well, where uh, either competition enforcement or competition. Um, policy leads to uncertainty within the innovation um, the, within the innovation sector um, and we see this 
with competition specifically as competition sort of acts as a, uh, a sort of last bastion of, to protect, of, of protecting um, the market and, and making sure that market players are, are acting uh, appropriately. However, um, the, the idea of creating a, a rigorous competition uh, enforcement environment, as Fleur mentioned as well, creates the, the atmosphere that, uh, of well, the potential for um, uncertainty and companies are, are, not, uh, are not able to, to gauge whether or not a particular uh, investment or uh, R&D um, endeavor would be worth the risk of potentially having competition authorities coming to, uh, you know, knocking on the door 10 years later. Uh, and these obstacles to innovation, they are a concern to us. And th this is the type of, uh, of thing we want to avoid. And just uh, to finish, I, mean, I think one of our main roles is to engage in uh, communication and collaboration with regulators, with policymakers, but also with uh, enforcement authorities to make sure that our common goals, which are basically a well-regulated competitive market, can be reached without there being uh, obstacles to, uh, to innovation. Thank you, uh, very, very interesting. I was uh, wondering, I wanted to, to push a little bit further this uh, question of uh, regulating prices and the role, is there a role for is there a role for uh, competition authorities to play or is this something that uh, should stay with, uh, with pricing regulator? Because indeed, uh, we are in a, in a field where it's not supply and demand uh, that decide, or at least not the, the, the standard understanding of uh, uh, supply and demand. I mean, we are not uh, in... Uh, uh, <laughs> we are not uh, buying and selling... Uh, Coca-Cola or uh, uh, you know bread and uh, bread and butter. It's uh, m medications where patients actually do not want do not want to buy. They just need because it's for their health. And this is why we have health regulators uh, working on that and l looking into um, parameters that uh, um, try to combine both. Uh, innovation incentives, which uh, you were talking about, uh, Grimor, uh, but also managing public budgets because uh, actually it's not the consumer or not directly the, the consumer who, you, who is paying, but uh, uh, often it's uh, public authorities who are, um, who are involved with reimbursement. So there is a budget to manage, there is innovation to manage, and also there is indeed a part to play for competition in the sense that uh, uh, we are aiming at having more companies um, acting, uh, but uh, in this, um, 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 I would say, conflicting uh, or interest or a lot of interest to take into account, is there a role to, for, for competition authorities uh, uh, to play or, or what, uh, how, is, is there a borderline or dividing mark for, for their intervention? It, it's. I mean, I've been capable of saying where the cursor should be placed. I think that there's two things for me. One, and I come back to the predictability. There's a moment you might say, like, pay for delays. You may agree or you may not agree with how they do it, but at least it's clear. You've got the rules. You know what game you're playing, if I can call it a game. Or, you know, by what rules, you know, you need to abide. So the first thing for me is the, the unpredictability one. The other one is, I mean, when it comes to pricing, the, the issue I always have in the pharma industry, that there's two of them. One is the gut feeling that sometimes the price is too high. That individual people feel like this, I can understand, that an authority lets its enforcement policy be guided by a gut feeling that the price doesn't feel right is another issue. Because when you look at that price, you have some areas where there's some freedom for pricing, and you see cases, for example, in the UK where you take it off the reimbursement system, and in that case, you can pretty much, you know, because it's no longer reimbursed, then the level of the pricing is no longer controlled. In most of the European countries, drugs are reimbursed, the price is controlled. The authority will look at the facial list price of a drug and say that doesn't look right. They're not considering all the net rebate. They're not considering the fact that the price usually includes the intermediaries 
also, which add their margin. They're not considering, most importantly, the fact that in the vast majority of EU countries, when the payer sits down with the pharma companies at the beginning of the year, they negotiate the budget. They said, this is basically how much I'm willing to spend on your drugs, whichever ones it is and whatever price, and anything above that, you have a, they call the clawback or payback system, which is that you pay back part or all of the turnover that you do in excess of that. So basically, I mean, in Greece, if I'm not mistaken, it's a 100% clawback system. So if basically you're told at the beginning of the year what turnover you can achieve. Anything in excess, the patients get the drugs, but basically you're providing for free because the money goes back to the state. So also having authorities decide on excessive pricing without considering that, actually what is the price that you're looking at, from either, this is, I mean, if you're going to look at it, then you need to have that discussion. You need to look at all of that. You need to see also that when a payer decides on the price, as I said, they're trying to balance budget, patient access, and incentives. This is why if you look at the countries who do you know, international reference pricing, so they basically, they don't negotiate. They say, I will take this basket of countries, and I want the price that is either the highest, the lowest, or the middle. I'm amused to see that in my private life when I talk about the system of international reference pricing, people automatically assume that each country wants to be the lowest price of the basket. And when you tell them actually that that's not true because some of them want to send the signal also that they're rewarding innovation. So they might say, I want to be in the middle of this. I mean, where the cursor is, I think in, in Italy, if I'm not mistaken, there's a moment where IFA and the AGCM you know, made a cooperation agreement, so they discussed together upstream. If that's how they want to do it, I'm totally fine. Again, the concern is the previsibility. What you don't want is you get a price, and then five years later, suddenly, an authority with hindsight will tell you that the price that you negotiated in full respect of the pricing process in that country was actually not the right price or was not what it believes the product is worth. So the cursor, I think for me, the main cursor will be, I mean, there's the one in the ideal world, which I'm not going to mention, but the real cursor, I think, is predictability. You cannot revisit five years later a price that was validated by an authority. You cannot go in something and then completely ignore half of what actually comes into the building of the price. Yeah, that's, uh, that's indeed a very helpful insight, which shows that uh, pricing in, pharmaceutical, in the pharmaceutical sector is extremely complex, so there is probably a room for dealing this, uh, with this upstream in order to yeah. ensure more predict Which again, doesn't, I'm not saying, because it's complex or regulated, they have no room to play. I'm just saying, you know, it needs to be considered better. Yeah. Um, I would uh, like to ask uh, Grimor a question it's still around pricing, but around something that's, uh, uh, that I think is uh, one of the topics of, um, that has been discussed in, in the industry, the, the new types of, uh, of treatments. We are talking about, a lot about uh, uh, gene and cell therapy. We are talking a lot about uh, personalized treatment. Um, we are talking also about uh, combination therapies where we take medications that uh, um, are authorized for certain indications and others for, uh, um, for a certain number of uh, indications and then we combine those treatments to provide a new, uh, a new treatment and obviously all these uh, new products that have been developed and it is great because uh, uh, they seek to, to address uh, unmet medical needs, which is the purpose of uh, research and development and the purpose of the, um, of the pharmaceutical industry. But when it comes to pricing, that's where it becomes quite complicated, either because on the one hand, these, these are therapies which at least today still cost a lot, and this is not only about uh, investing in research and development, but also about the risk of launching uh, a, a product or rather going through the clinical trial process in order to have a medication that can or maybe cannot work. Um, so that, that's one question about how do you price these uh, very innovative uh, uh, treatments. And on the other hand, as uh, the combination treatments where you can have a, um, a medical product by one company and a medical product by another company that are being combined. Each one of them has a price if they are authorized for different indications, but then they will be used together for a treatment. So how do you determine the price or how do you determine the added value of this, uh, uh, of this new treatment? Uh, obviously, in, in a... Uh, not in an ideal world, but in a, in a world without competition, uh, the two 
com companies would sit together and uh, say, okay, what is your price? What is my price? Let's go together to the re regulator and discuss. But obviously, uh, with competition rules, you need to consider the risk of exchanging extremely sensitive information, discussing prices, which may be anti-competitive. So what do we do? Are these uh, subjects discussed and what are the approaches around which uh, there has been discussion uh, at European level? Yeah, I mean, this is uh, obviously, uh, it, it's a very obvious example of how you know, competition law uh, can enter into uh, the, um, the innovation of, well, with, with combination therapies you know, in particular. It's, it's, you know, you, you're talking about two companies who are joining forces to create a product based on products that already exist. You know, um, and the added value would basically be a, uh, an innovative product uh, based on two combination on, on the combination of two existing products produced by two different companies the um, the, the the potential for sort of competition abuse or the or the uh, or the perception of competition abuse is is sort of clear we're talking about companies are working together to create a product and then once that product is on the market how is that priced i don't have an answer for that uh, you know at this point this is something that we're working on we're working on uh, how to uh, approach this you know from uh, a regulatory point of view from uh, a scientific point of view and, and then also from a competition point of view and uh, and you know typically this is something where i think um, there should be there, there should be communication from an early stage uh, with regulators and with authorities that it, uh, as has been the, the, the theme for this the, this predictability you know th there should be predictability when uh, scientists essentially decide to collaborate that the product that they're going to create is is going to be uh, legally accessible and, and not be in breach of, of any uh, competition rules um, unfortunately we're seeing a, a, you know a trend um, you know going away from com combination therapies, but I, I believe yesterday that we had a, se um, a session on uh, horizontal block exemptions and, and we're seeing a trend there where uh, R&D agreements between companies are, are being subjected to uh, a, an even stricter set of uh, requirements than, than currently, uh, where um, companies are basically being expected to uh, establish themselves that the, how, uh, how um, how much other companies are uh, able and uh, or have the capacity and, and how likely they are to to enter that that specific market or have uh, similar types of products to in order to be uh, competing with them. Um, unfortunately, in terms of combination therapies, I don't have I don't have a, a crystal ball and much less. A, a clear answer as to how these things uh, or how the pricing needs to be approached in order for it to be completely above board from a competition perspective. Uh, I can say that this is something that we are working on uh, regularly and you know, the, the topic comes up on, uh, very frequently and the topic comes up because, because there is uncertainty. The uncertainty exists and there, you know, what, what we want to avoid is that there is reluctance uh, among the, the our members or the the, the, the pharmaceutical sector in, in more broadly that there is reluctance to innovate for fear of there being um, for, for fear of breaching competition rules somewhere down the line so I think the predictability issue is is absolutely crucial and uh, I go back to then the uh, the collaboration that can happen between industry players and and regulators from from an early stage Thank you. I will have maybe one last question before I let uh, the discussion open to the uh, questions from, uh, from the audience. But, uh, and maybe my last question is rather rhetorical, but I would love to hear your thoughts about it. Is there a room for uh, using more the, the uh, tools uh, at, uh, available at the Commission level, but maybe opening them also at national level for more informal guidance uh, on such topics which are clearly um, new topics? And we have seen the, the Commission during the COVID crisis open up the possibility 
for, for a short time in its uh, temporary framework uh, uh, and issuing a couple of uh, comfort letters in a situation that was quite unusual. Uh, is there a room maybe for uh, l leaving more room for such informal guidance? Would that some, be something that would help uh, having more predictability? Or is this just soft law that uh, would probably not have <laughs> that much value? For me, soft law is better than no law. <laughs> So, you know, I, I know Grimbold and still think hard law is better than soft law, but, you know, c compared to the nothing at all, and the combination pricing is one of those areas that, that the lack of any clarity is a real hindrance. And I can tell you, you know, there is high awareness in companies about the sensitivities around pricing. People get very nervous when you even get there. And even I found myself not being able to advise because there's no guidance on how do you do it. I remember the first FBI discussions were like, and we even discuss the topic. So, you know, I mean, there has to be something that helps us actually as an industry progress in that area. And the best thing is those preliminary discussions and having some first positions also rather than, you know, you learn by, uh, learn by failing basically, which is, you know, very costly, both reputationally, fi financially, and from a compliance. So waiting for the first decision of an authority which tells you you got it right or you got it wrong, I mean, for me, this is not sustainable and this is not ideal in any manner. Yeah, I mean, I can second that absolutely. Uh, and you know, the, the fact that soft law is better than no law, it's true, but there needs to still be the, uh, the, the confidence that this is, can be relied upon, that, you know, there can be guidance, there can be informal uh, approvals, there can be form, informal discussions, but, you know, once, uh, once the conduct has then been made, it has been made, and th w there needs to be uh, the, the certainty that, the, the guidance has to have some kind of some kind of legal weight as well, um, and yes, we saw during the COVID crisis we saw uh, comfort letters, we saw uh, alleviation of certain rules to deal with uh, you know, the, the particular emergency that that was, and we saw the pharmaceutical industry, um, I think, step up uh, to to a, to a large extent and. Um, and we want to keep doing that. I think you know that, that's that that's the main thing that we want to keep uh, providing innovative treatments and providing uh, medicinal products to to patients. That is ultimately what uh, what the industry is there for. Um, and the, and the dialogue with the authorities is actually the natural way of functioning in regulated industries. Huh? Yes. So it's not be it with the antitrust or with other authorities. The industry functions through dialogue from the beginning until the end. There's very little we're allowed to do without getting approval first. And anyway, without ensuring that the direction we're taking also for drug development is actually the ones that, you know, health authorities want to see us do. And in the context of the, the review of the pharmaceutical legislation as well, I mean, we are obviously, you know, in, in close contact with, uh, with the European Commission on that, with DG Santé. Um, and uh, I would hope that uh, once the, the inter-service consultation happens within the Commission, that DG Comp also takes uh, an uh, an important uh, role in that and looks at the the proposals from a competition point of view to see what is you know how that can be uh, incorporated and how, you know how it can be how the review of the the pharmaceutical legislation as a, as a whole can be viewed holistically also from a from a competition perspective mm -hmm. and to avoid also the fact that competition law is strictly being applied to uh, a sector su such a specific sector as the pharmaceutical uh, one is in a way that isn't uh, tailored to it. So I think, you know, communication and, and collaboration from an early stage, both in, you know, especially in terms of uh, policy and legislation creation, I think is very important. So here's a call to, to competition law enforcers to, to more uh, predictability and maybe to, to more soft and further hard law about uh, how the rules uh, should be applied. And upon this, we have uh, just uh, two small minutes if there are any burning questions from, from the audience on any of the topics discussed or more. No Perhaps just very quickly one question might be interesting. If, um, do you find that in your experience, thank you. In my practice, there is an area where um, antitrust practice. Uh, Actually better without the mic. Yeah, because the echo, sorry, the echo is too big with the mic. So, actually, I see a clarity number of areas when it comes to uh, anti-gas enforcement. I don't see very much clarity in division of markets. 
Mm. I don't know whether you have experienced this. So we have one case in Italy, Pfizer, you might be familiar with that. But other than that, I see that. So they very often you know, because I see a tension between division of patents, so they come in cluster very often. So by the very nature, they might be quite true. The commission has increased, you know, in this uh, notorious, to say, you know, start, um, sector inquiry, that there might be, you know, there might be questionable, uh, depending on the situation. Mm -hmm. So in your experience, do you open uh, up? So in my experience, I think the first thing I can say, and I think any antitrust lawyer has lived it and felt it, IP is probably the one area where we feel the biggest tension with antitrust law. Because by definition, one is about granting, you know, the possibility to exclude the use of your technology. The other one is about ultimately opening the market for patient benefits, which is why, you know, we always work closely with the IP team in private practice and in-house also. Now, the divisional patent for me, typically, once I actually got in-house, and when you start having in-depth discussion, there's, there are a lot of aspects that you start understanding about what are divisional patents. For one thing, how they work. So the fact that it's actually not a multiplication of filings because there's a succession of levels where you need to drop some to have some. So you make choices. What you realize also is that the timing actually of the filing of patents is simply reflecting the timing of research. Because what we often forget in the pharma industry if you don't file fast enough, and we've seen cases where you lose a patent because one person mentioned it on the LinkedIn post on some social media, he mentioned a tiny thing about the invention, and then once you go and file for the patent, like too late, it's public. So there is a tension to file very early. The earlier you file, the less precise your patent is, because you're still at an early stage of understanding the science that you're developing. So the, the, the purpose of the divisional patent is actually to allow you to narrow as you progress by family, you know, fighting within a family, and you become closer and closer and closer ultimately to the technology that you will actually exploit. So the science behind the filings actually make a lot of sense. And once you understand that, you understand sort of better, or, you know, it's a completely different perspective from the antitrust perception of a multiplication of stuff all over the place. Now, is it easy to handle from an antitrust perspective? No. And I think this is somewhere in the house where there are a lot of discussions, you know, between IP and, you know, antitrust on the filings and the enforcement, actually, which is more important than the filing. And there's a moment typically also as an antitrust authority, I think you can't be, you should not be constantly assuming that you know better than a patent authority whether a patent should have been delivered or not. So typically this is, you know, the work that you do a lot in house on the level of transparency on, you know, with authorities as well as with the market. But I, I agree this is, a, this is, I think, an area where we probably will get some clarification. And I think it's important because we also don't want to be in a situation where the compound patent is the only thing that is considered as having any value. So I don't know if I do. Yeah, if I can just add really quickly, I'm not an IP lawyer, uh, and, um, but the, the, the discussions that I've been in w involving uh, divisional patents, for me, the the perception, well, the, the, the wrong perception that I've heard people uh, put forward is essentially that a divisional patent is, uh, has the purpose of extending the, the mother patent, which it does not. And I think, you know, but this is a, this is a perception that exists, that companies are, uh, have a product that are, or have a patent that is reaching its end and they think, well, you know, we we'll start panicking, we have to uh, throw out a bunch of divisional patents in order to protect our our original patent. That is not the case. That 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 is not what happens. And I think uh, maybe uh, for me, I, as I say, I'm not a, I'm not an IP lawyer. I don't know all the ins and outs of it. But um, th this is something that seems to be a, a sort of prevailing uh, belief. Um, and yeah, that, that simply isn't the case. I can further. Yeah, But if you look at it though from, I mean, if you take a step back, the interesting thing is, you know, they're actually the patterns throughout the life of the product get narrower and narrower, which technically means actually the room for competition gets bigger and bigger. 
So the only thing that really extends the protection that you might have from an IP perspective on the BROCT is the SPC. And the supplementary protection certificate is the only thing that will extend, while keeping exactly the same scope, will extend in time. And this was a deliberate regulatory decision made because you have to file so early on your patents, you know, your patents on the molecule, and the regulatory process and the launch timelines because of, you know, Apart from Germany, where you can launch on day one, most countries, it will take roughly a year to negotiate a price. So all this is time that you're basically losing. You have your exclusivity, but it's absolutely of no value because you still haven't launched. And the SPC has addressed this by adding you know, potential years while ensuring you don't exceed 15 anyway. So that, that is the only one. And because it's a mirror extension, there's little debate about this one. But the rest might be going sideways a little bit, but generally it's actually smaller and smaller and smaller as time goes. So the perception often that you're extending all over the place is actually not quite right. And the only thing that does give you new protection and that comes very late is more things like indication patents, which are actually reward to innovation but are very hard to implement. And we saw a few years ago, there was a lot of litigation uh, you know, around two big products that I won't name from two different companies that I won't name. But it was interesting to see the work that had to be done at country level to actually ensure that uh, indication patents, second indication use patents were protected while allowing generics to come into the sort of non-protected indication with carved out labels. It's very technical, it's fascinating from an IP perspective, it's difficult to manage from, um, from an antitrust one. And this is typically, I think, where there's maybe also more room to ensure that, you know, authorities come in, you know, regulating through decisions in the field are actually really understanding how it all comes together. Thank you. We are um, a little bit over time, but just to check there is not uh, one last uh, burning question. Yes, please. Uh, can I ask just one question for... <laughs> uh, you highlighted is a predict predictability issue, predictability, and what competition area is the most unpredictable from your industry's perspective? And could you please give me a real example which discourages your in, uh, innovation <laughs> incentive? It's just but our discussion was uh, a little bit theoretical, so I want to know some specific examples. Which cases or which investigation discouraged industry's uh, incentive to innovate? Is um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not going to speak about individual investigations or, or individual cases. Uh, we're, we're uh, you know, we, we approach these uh, these enforcement trends and uh, and yeah, and, and regulatory trends, uh, you know, uh, as as broadly as possible. And you know, we're not looking into, into specifically going. Um, this investigation is happening, and therefore we must react in this way. Um, you know, we have an opportunity now with the review of the pharmaceutical legislation to uh, to get our position across to regulators as widely as possible. Um, so yeah, I, I don't really have a, you know, an, an opinion or a, or a position on what is the least certain aspect or you know, what is the, 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 the biggest or most important uh, obstacle to, to innovation. Um, yeah, we, we'll try to look at this from, uh, from uh, you know, a, a broad perspective and, and, and approach things as, uh, as if, you know, efficiently as we can in, in, in that sense. So uh, apologies if that doesn't really answer your question. I don't know if you have a, anything for to For me, I don't know if I would link it just directly to innovation, but the most concerning one also from a public safety perspective is the disparagement cases. The ones where they start saying you cannot talk freely to your regulator, who is an extremely technically competent body. This is the one where I have a true concern because this is the one area where we should be able to have the discussions we need to have, and a lot of them also revolve around safety, and we should be able to talk about safety because this is the thing that is at the heart of our industry. Fiona.
is ongoing. Uh, I spoke in this room yesterday about the revision of the R&D block exemption, where they want to add yet another hurdle, whereby you have to, in order to qualify for the safe harbor, you have to figure out whether there are at least three comparable R&D research and development polls out there. And I think, you know, that's just inexplicable, that level of complexity, and it's potentially going to um, put people off collaborating, which has got to be a good thing, right? Also, also because from a medical perspective, there isn't really any consumer interest in having five different products, for example, coming in roughly for the same thing. What you do have an interest in is having some competing ones which are slightly different because it's the difference that's actually interesting from a therapeutic perspective. If you're a doctor, you want to have choices between products that may address the same disease but in different manners so that you can take whatever is best for your patient. So they're actually you know, joining forces to go faster is actually often more to the patient benefit than having several, you know, also with a lot of R&D wasted money at some stage. Because, you know, research and development is extremely costly and it's better sometimes to be able to focus it a bit more. So I, I, I do think this is actually a good example. Thank you very much. Uh, it was indeed a very dense discussion and apologies for being a little bit over time. And thank you again, Fleur and Grimer, for uh, your uh, very uh, insightful contribution to this discussion. Thank you very much.